Hi everyone. Today, I want to deep dive into the Sharia once more. We're going to explore Islam's most important, its most fundamental doctrine, something called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. We're also going to learn why Islamic apologists turn abusive. And of course, you should have figured out by now that the two are connected. The abuse that Islamic apologists heap on Christians and others in the YouTube comments, Facebook, and so on is mandatory and it comes directly from the Sharia law. I want to talk about commanding the right and forbidding the wrong goes under different names, enjoining right, forbidding wrong, promoting right, and so on. You'll find slightly different names. I'll skip the Arabic name for this, but the English name will suffice. If we look into the world's most popular, most famous Sharia manual, the Reliance of the Traveler, we see here that Ibn Qudama Makdisi says one should know that commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the most important fundamental of the religion that's of Islam and is the mission that Allah sent the prophets to fulfill. Now, do remember that Islam claims that every single of the 140,000 prophets that appeared in every language on the planet for which they have no proof whatsoever was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim, Abraham was a Muslim, David was a Muslim, they were all Muslims. They say that commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the most important fundamental, the basic doctrine, the most fundamental doctrine of Islam. If it were folded up and put away, religion itself would vanish, dissolution appear, and whole lands come to ruin. It is that important within Islam. When we look through the index of the Reliance of the Traveler, section A is sacred knowledge, and as we look through here, we've got O, justice you will find jihad defined in section O, justice, then we have enormities. And then we have section Q, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. It has its own section. It's a complete doctrine. The source of this is Imam al-Ghazali, and we will discuss him a little later. In Islam, they believe that all of the Muslims' words count against him and not for him unless he is speaking to command the right and forbid the wrong. This would partly explain why Muslims have such terrible arguments. They can say anything, they can heap abuse, they can shout, they can scream, because this is the one time that they are getting reward from Allah, so that their words are not counted against them by Allah, but count for them. So they are actually earning reward and the praise of Allah. They are bringing good into the world. So this hadith, which is found in Reliance, section R1, 2.5, as well as in Sunan Ibn Majah, volume 5, book 36, hadith 3974, says all of the human's words count against him and not for him, except commanding the right and forbidding the wrong and the mention of Allah. This is repeated in the Sharia. All of the human's words count against him and not for him, except commanding the right, forbidding the wrong and the mention of Allah. Understand the Sharia, Islamic law, the sacred Islamic law, is the Muslim Talmud. It is the equivalent of the Talmud, just as you have rabbinic Judaism, which relies on the Talmud and not the Torah. Exactly so, Islam today relies on the Sharia, not so much the Quran and the Hadith. These Hadiths are not taken raw, they are interpreted through the scholars, and those ultimate interpretations of all the verses that remain unabrogated are found in the Sharia. This, of course, is the Reliance of the Traveler, the world's most famous and popular Sharia manual. I will link it below, read it. It's going to it's going to open your eyes to raw, naked Islam. Communal obligation, a communally obligatory or fad al-kifaya act is what the lawgiver. Now, the lawgiver is either Allah or Muhammad. There is no distinction between them in the Sharia. As far as the Sharia is concerned, Allah is Muhammad and Muhammad is Allah. So a fad kifaya act or a communal act, which is obligatory, is what the lawgiver requires from the collectivity of those morally responsible. In other words, Muslims who achieved puberty. Not from each one of them specifically, but if someone in the group, a small minority, that small minority undertakes it, then the obligation has been fulfilled and the sin is lifted from the rest. So if they do not fight against the bad and promote the good, which is heaping abuse on us, then sin falls on the Islamic community. If no one undertakes it, then all are guilty of serious sin for neglecting the obligations. And examples include commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, defined in book Q, as we can see there. Prayer, daily prayer, for instance, is, a, is an obligatory action that Muslims must undertake. Right, now, right, abuse, intimidate, assault, and maim. And this is commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. 
this is within the contents, the index of the reliance of the traveler, the obligation to command the right. So it is obligatory. It's a communal obligation. And they speak of the levels of censure. And you can ignore this part about having the caliph's permission. That's, <laughs> it's not required. They speak here of the act of censuring. This means to disapprove, to judge in a harsh manner. And this is what they're doing to us. They're judging us in a very harsh. They're providing disapproval in the strongest, most harsh terms. There are degrees of severity. So they have to forbid the act verbally. They have to forbid the act with harsh words. In other words, revile us to abuse and to heap scorn. They have to right the wrong by hand. We would know this as jihad. They have to intimidate. They have to assault. And they have to use force of arms. In fact, they need to collect together a gang of their men and make sure that they forbid this act as a group. Note Hartun Tash recently being forced out of Speaker's Corner. This is defined, these steps are defined in the Sharia, Muslims are required. And when they act this way, they are gaining the favor of Allah. They are fulfilling the will of Allah. This is righteous. The obligation to command the right. So Allah says, let there be a group of you who call to good, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. For those are the successful. Abuse brings success. Now this verse, Quran 3, 1 of 4, is the fundamental basis of the most important doctrine within Islam. They believe that Muslims must promote good and forbid evil. We are the evil. They are the good. They must promote the Sharia and enforce it upon everyone. This is ultimately what this means. There are about seven other verses that are related to this one that reinforce this, but this is the fundamental verse that is used. We're going to see the exegesis of this word within the Muslim Talmud, the Sharia. You're going to see how they take this one verse and turn this into an entire doctrine with rules that are applied that Muslims must follow. Abuse is righteous. So this verse explains that commanding the right and forbidding the wrong are a communal rather than a personal obligation. Allah says, let there be a group of you and not all of you command the right. So if enough people do it, meaning whenever a wrong is seen, one of those who see it corrects it. The responsibility is lifted from the rest. Those who perform it being expressly mentioned as the successful. Abuse brings success. There are many verses in the Quran about commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Whoever of you sees something wrong, let him change it with his hand. And we know what they mean by that. If unable to, let him change it with his tongue. We've heard the abuse. If unable, then with his heart, they have to hate us in their hearts. And that is the weakest degree of faith. So if you simply hate in your heart, you are being weak. Command the right and forbid the wrong, or Allah will put the worst of you in charge of the best of you. And the best will supplicate to Allah, will pray to Allah, and they will be left unanswered. Abuse others, or Allah will abandon you. Abuse them, or Allah will punish you. Those who go astray will not harm you if you are guided. So they believe they are guided by the hand of Allah to do what they do. And people who do not change something wrong when they see it on the verge of a sweeping punishment from Allah. So if they do not do this, they will be punished by Allah. So to prevent the punishment, they need to take action to prevent us from committing these evil acts. Christianity, for instance. Having the Caliph's permission. Some scholars stipulate that the person delivering the censure must have permission to do so from the Caliph, defined in section 025. This is untrue, for the Quranic verses and hadiths all indicate that whoever sees something wrong and does nothing has sinned. Stipulating that there must be permission from the Caliph is mere arbitrary opinion. Now there are five levels of censure. The child is entitled to explain the nature of the act, to admonish and advise his parents politely, and finally may censure at the fourth level by such things as breaking objects, pouring out wine, breaking wine bottles, and so on. Teach them while they're young, right? Do it if you can get away with it. So being able to censure the rules. It is a necessary condition that the person condemning something wrong must be able to do so. Someone who is unable to is not obliged to condemn it except in his heart, the weakest degree of faith. And if you want to be a good Muslim, use these. That's what it says in the book. The obligation is not only lifted when physically unable, but also when one fears that the problems will result for one which also comes under the heading of inability. 
The obligation to censure the wrong is likewise lifted when one knows that the reproach will be ineffective. So if you can get away with it, do it. If you're not going to have an effect, there will be no reward from Allah. When one knows that the wrong will be eliminated by speaking or by acting without entailing problems for oneself, one is obliged to censure it. When one knows that speaking will be ineffective and one will be beaten if one does, one is not obliged to. Now, when one knows that one's censure will be ineffective, but it does not entail problems for one, one is recommended to censure the act in order to manifest the standards of Islam and remind people of their religion. So, abuse is standard practice in Islam. Hadiths that seem to show the non-obligatory nature of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong are understood by Islamic scholars as referring to specific situations and are not global statements. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong will be obligatory until the day of judgment. This will never stop unless we expose this, unless we speak about this, we confront Muslims with this, we make this knowledge public and we turn public sentiment against this because this is vile, this is violence. Only sane people should abuse others, only people with normal temperament should do it. So it's not a guy who went insane, someone has to rationally decide to commit this violence. Cowardice does not enter into consideration here, nor foolhardy courage, but rather the normal temperament of someone with a sound disposition. Someone has to logically decide rationally that he should abuse and use violence. Problems mean being beaten, killed, robbed, or acquiring a bad name in town. As for being reviled and disparaged, it is not an excuse to remain silent. But someone who commands what is right generally meets with it. So in other words, look, you're going to get grief, do it anyway. Don't worry about what people say. This is what the Islamic Talmud, the Sharia, teaches. Deal with it, they say. Deal with the resistance you're going to face. Use harsh words and foul language. So, forbidding the act verbally. In Q5.4, it says the third degree of severity is to prohibit the act by admonition, advice, and making the other fear Allah, mentioning the hadiths, then go on to censure with harsh words. The fourth degree of severity consists of reviling the person and bearing down on him with sharp, harsh words. The section in blue is not accurately translated. We will go through the original, and I will show you what the original says. This document, when you read it, shows that the original comes from Al-Ghazali's Ikhya Ulum al-Din. This is a book that is the second most read Islamic religious text after the Quran. We'll get to that later. One does not resort to this degree unless one is unable to prevent the person by politeness, and he shows he wants to persist, or he mocks one's admonitions and advice. Reviling him does not mean vulgarity, except the word revile means to use vulgarity. It means to be abusive. That's what revile means. Rather, say, you degenerate, you idiot, you ignoramus, do you not fear Allah, and so forth. Allah, most high quotes, and they bring in Abraham from the Bible. Yeah, when you read this for yourself, look through that, and tell me if Abraham actually said any of that. Break things, it's for their own good. So writing the wrong by hand. The fifth degree consists of changing the blameworthy thing with one's hand, such as by breaking musical instruments. Yeah, smash his guitar. Pour out wine, break wine bottles. In fact, if you read through this, they'll say, use rocks. And if you can't get to the person, throw rocks. And if you break other things, like his windows, his furniture in the process, you are not liable for damage. Break the instruments, for example, just enough to prevent their being used for disobedience and no more. But if you're throwing rocks through a window, can you guarantee the amount of damage that you're going to cause? Or be careful not to break the bottles when pouring out wine. If one cannot manage except by throwing rocks at the bottles or the like, then one may do so and one is not obliged to cover the damages. It's not illegal. It's okay. Smash it for Allah. Intimidation is the religious thing to do. Intimidation, Q5.7, the sixth degree is threatening and intimidation, such as by saying, stop this or I will. And when possible, this should precede actually hitting the person. So you can just hit them in the face. That's okay. I mean, try to threaten, try to intimidate, but you know, if you can't get it, just, just hit them anyway. That's fine. Just hit them. Does it say, oh, well, no, just hit them. Whatever is effective, right? Hit them enough. Uh, then assault. Allah will bless you. The religion of assault. Assault, Q5.8. The seventh degree is to directly hit or kick the person or similar measures 
that do not involve weapons. We're not at weapons yet. We're not at gang warfare yet. This is permissible for private individuals. Right, so take it upon yourself to beat and kick people to stop them from, I don't know, like singing hymns, going to church, drinking wine, playing music, right? Force of arms. The eighth degree is when one is unable to censure the act by oneself and requires the armed assistance of others. Religion of gang warfare. Gang warfare. Now, we come to the final slide, and this is Al-Ghazali, and this is his book, the Ikhya Ulum al-Din, Volume 2, right here. Well, got Volume 3 on the cover, but the sixth stage is to threaten and warn. Now, he was the scholar that best defined the doctrine, so he's regarded as the top scholar on this issue. Al-Ghazali is also the most highly regarded scholar in all of Islam. There are 28 scholars that over the last 1400 years have been known as Sheikh al-Islam. They're the top scholars of Islam, but Al-Ghazali sits above them. He is unique in having a particular title. So he is regarded as the most knowledgeable scholar of Islam. He formed Islam as we know today, and this doctrine comes from him. The sixth stage is to threaten and warn. If all the previous modes of correction fail, this method should be adopted. So yeah, threaten and warn. And the seventh stage is to assault by hand or stick. Beat them with a stick. I wonder where that... I wonder if we've seen that in Islam before. The religion of beating with a stick. The religion of assault. Do this in case the previous modes of correction fail. The eighth stage is to fight with followers being armed. So arm yourself and then the religion of gang warfare takes place. So many a time, arms are necessary to ward off evil because many a time a wrongdoer with his party remain ready to fight. So yeah, in case people disagree with you and they get people to, to protect themselves from your violence, go and get more people, go and get weapons, and then make sure that you uh, impose your will with violence and weapons. So yeah, when the two parties meet, the fight begins, and it is necessary for the pleasure of Allah to remove injuries of sinful actions. Allah was injured by you, I don't know, singing a hymn, starting a church, converting to Christianity, and uh, for the injury against Allah, get your friends, get your weapons, shed blood. It is allowed for the warriors against the unbelievers. For unbelief, get a stick, beat them with it. Yes, similarly, it is necessary to bring the great transgressors under control. The fourth stage, just to remind us, is abuse and using harsh words. Notice the translation in the Reliance isn't entirely accurate. When it fails, use harsh words and abuse him. Yes, use harsh words and abuse him. I, yeah, that seems pretty straightforward. My final slide. These are the five stages from the Ikhya Ulum al-Din. There are five stages of enjoining good, forbidding evil. The first stage is giving simple advice. The second stage is to give sermon with sweet words. The third stage is to abuse and mete out harsh treatment. Uh, there are some typos in this document. So the third stage is to abuse and mete out harsh treatment. The fourth stage is to apply force. Remember, with the fist. That's what they say, with your hand. And prevent one from doing a sinful act, such as throw wine from its pot, or throw rocks, or beat with a stick. The fifth stage is to assault, beat, and threaten. The fifth stage is to assault, beat, and threaten. I hope that's clear. This is why Islamic apologists turn to violence, and this is why Muslims turn to violence. It is part of a doctrine called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. It is in the Muslim Talmud, the Sharia. I hope that was useful. I'll see you in the comments. And here's a rule. If you're a Muslim and you're going to make a comment, you will tell me what school of fiqh you belong to. You will give me that information. And you will use Sharia texts, you will use fiqh texts, scholarly works, clear citation. Your opinion is not accepted. I want to see scholarly texts in your responses. I want to know what school of fiqh you belong to so that we know which scholars you follow and which Sharia manuals you follow. You will give me this or I will delete your comments. Thank you. Goodbye.